Good evening. Uh, welcome. I'm Walter Sterling, the Dean of St. John's College, Santa Fe, and I'm pleased to welcome you all for this evening's presentation and lecture. Offered in conjunction with the Dean's Lecture and Concert Series, we typically have weekly lectures or concerts on Friday evenings. And for those of you new to the college here, our weekly calendar of events can be found online. Uh, we are glad to welcome members of our campus community and also to welcome folks from the local and regional legal community as well as from policy, government, and local tribal communities. For those new to the area or to St. John's and our campus, uh, I want to mention that in addition to our undergraduate program, we have offerings you may want to become aware of, including summer and winter enrichment programs called Summer and Winter Classics, a summer academy for high school students with week-long programs, and two master's programs that run year-round, one in Western Classics and Liberal Arts, and one in Eastern Classics of India, China, and Japan. All of these programs are available on campus or online. And we have some materials available on a table uh, just outside the door here and some representatives of the college, including myself, uh, and our Associate Dean for Graduate Programs, Ned Walpin, who is up here near the front, uh, will be here for the reception after the lecture and be happy to talk with any of you about any questions you might have. Uh, the format for this evening is that uh, Mr. Schaefer will uh, present for about 90 minutes. So you can refresh yourselves along the way with water, coffee, tea, uh, as you need. And then after that, we're going to have a reception with beer and wine and some snacks for anyone who wants to stay. Uh, and Patrick will be happy to uh, take questions and have conversation during uh, the reception. Uh, it's my pleasure this evening to introduce Patrick Schaefer. Patrick is a recognized expert in international trade and investment law with over 20 years of experience in government, academia, and the private sector. He currently serves as general counsel for the New Mexico Department of Finance and Administration. He's provided briefings, trainings, and seminars nationally and internationally for organizations such as the Department of Homeland Security, Joint Task Force North, the Aspen Institute, Aspen Institute Mexico, Aspen Institute Italia, the German Marshall Fund of the United States, the Pacific Council on International Policy, the Texas Lyceum, the New Mexico State Legislature, among many other diverse local, state, and international institutions. He has served as an, assistric, an, an assistant district attorney in the first judicial district of New Mexico, having previously served in the same capacity in the third judicial district in Las Cruces, New Mexico, on the United States-Mexico border. Previously, Patrick was the founding executive director of the Hunt Institute for Global Competitiveness, a pioneering research platform located at the University of Texas at El Paso that produces unique, detailed economic and legal analysis of the various market and enforcement mechanisms that converge along the United States-Mexico border. He earned his JD from the uh, University of New Mexico School of Law and most importantly here is a graduate of St. John's College. Uh, as an alum of our college, Patrick has volunteered, mentored, and supported our students and our college in many ways over the years, and his presence tonight is an extension of that spirit of service. Uh, his talk is titled, Tribal Nations and Trade, A History and Outlook for New Mexico. Please join me in welcoming Patrick Schaefer. Well, good evening, everybody. It's um, very wonderful to be here with you all, a real blessing, in fact. Uh, as Dean Sterling mentioned, I am an alumnus of this uh, great college, and uh, in many ways, this, this is a homecoming uh, from a personal perspective, but also from a, a couple other perspectives that I just wanted to mention as we begin. This is, um, what you're about to see really is a product and a consequence of my time at St. John's. And not only what we study, but how we study. And there's a principle here at the college which privileges discussion and privileges communication in order to understand not only different perspectives, but the different systems from which those perspectives arise. So I think that um, what I've often endeavored to provide to the community and to give back to New Mexico has been vehicles or mechanisms for us to better understand ourselves our place in the world, and more importantly, uh, how to work together. So with that, um, I want to get into tonight's presentation. Uh, this is just um, me as an alumnus, not anything to do with DFA in particular or the agency that I represent. Uh, for those here 
for CLE, just let me know afterwards and uh, we can get you those uh, CLE credits. So tonight's presentation, as Walter mentioned, is uh, entitled Tribal Nations in Trade, A History and Outlook for New Mexico. And in many ways, the origin of tonight's talk was um, uh, precipitated by what I have seen as an absence uh, in the uh, State Bar CLE, uh, uh, Continuing Legal Education Courses for Lawyers, that never discuss trade uh, in New Mexico and the impact that trade has had on our state, is having on our state, and will continue to have on our state. And something surely that's never really been mentioned before is the role, the impact, the, the opportunity for us to work more closely with uh, our tribal nations in order to manage a lot of these uh, uh, impacts that come from international trade as it courses through New Mexico and find regional and what amount to, as we'll see, cross-border and uh, cross-jurisdictional solutions. The story tonight begins here with an incident uh, that took place several years ago uh, in the Navajo Nation. And it really is the convergence of many market forces that we'll take a detailed look into tonight. But what you can see here, just even at first blush, uh, is the um, presence of Navajo Nation tribal police. You have here a Chinese undocumented migrant worker leaving a cannabis cultivation site uh, near Shiprock, New Mexico. So the question is, how did that happen? How did these characters, these individuals, these forces converge and collide in order to yield um, such a uh, circumstance. Uh, this was, um, uh, as you can see, uh, not legal uh, at the time, still not legal uh, in the Navajo Nation. And the reason that I really wanted to start with this, not only is it because it's very timely, but because this uh, picture and this incident really represent a lot of these issues around trade and tribal nations in New Mexico historically and also currently, such as uh, divisions of jurisdiction, divisions of um, criminal authority uh, between tribal lands, state lands, um, between state law, federal law, etc. This is also, um, I think, an opportune um, moment to consider the role that China has had and is having currently on New Mexico and, and will have, and the role and the flow of migrant workers uh, through New Mexico. The other um, area that I think is really important to mention as we get started is the relationship between commercial conditions that are advantageous to legal commerce, um, as well as commercial conditions that could be uh, advantageous to illicit commerce or organized crime. So here in this incident, with differences in jurisdiction, differences in regulatory authority, differences in taxes, differences in criminal enforcement even, you get opportunities uh, arising in places like the Navajo Nation uh, that it can some ways exacerbate the divisions uh, that trade and trade flows cause for our uh, communities. So I think that's what I really want to um, leave us with here as we embark on a journey tonight and go through um, our state and its history, is that trade can bring us together, for sure. It can bring products from across the world into our stores at a moment's notice. But there's also a lot of impacts of trade that cause to divide us and cause to divide communities. And not just geographically, but you know, for, for the lawyers here and, and for those who are interested in political systems, these kinds of trade flows can even divide societies and divide um, communities jurisdictionally uh, with the application of law. I want to start really at the beginning here, the very, very beginning, which is the earth. Um, and what you can see here is an elevation map of the upper part of North America. And what is special about New Mexico, or the region that we call New Mexico now, is that it's located between the Mississippi Valley, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Pacific Ocean. So if you look at this, um, uh, map and this presentation of the geography, you can already start to imagine and recognize uh, the value that New Mexico has as a gateway across the Rocky Mountains from the Midwest, the Great Lakes, those uh, Mississippi um, tributaries to the Southern Pacific, and as we'll see even in a few moments, down into uh, central Mexico. There really is no other way through the Rockies that is as efficient or as cost effective as going through New Mexico. And we'll see how that really has had a determinative impact on our state in the 19th and 20th centuries. 
part of the reason, and maybe most of the reason, why New Mexico is so special is because of the river systems that are cradled here in this community. New Mexico uh, sits basically at the breakwaters of the Colorado River and the Rio Grande. And what you can see here is that these tributaries and these large rivers provide immediate and efficient communication systems. You can walk in a river valley. You can walk along a river in order to get from one place to another. It's the most uh, geographically efficient way uh, to uh, proceed. And what you can see here with the uh, slight demarcation of the state boundaries is where New Mexico is. And for those of us who have lived here for a while or know, the Continental Divide courses north-south along the spine of New Mexico. So we really do sit between the, we're the buckle of the belt uh, between uh, the Pacific and the Atlantic. And this will have significant consequences, not only in early ancestral community engagements, but also currently. This is a map that I created to demonstrate the location of ancestral indigenous uh, communities and civilization here in the region. It's also important to note that um, these communities really um, distinguish themselves because in other places in North America and even Northern Mexico, in an area called Chichimeca, these were really the biggest urban centers that had significant populations and also significant structures. So to the west, to the east, to the north of New Mexico in this region, particularly the Four Corners region, we don't really have this kind of uh, sophisticated development um, historically. What's also uh, interesting and important to note is the orientation of major trading centers like uh, Paquime, which is just south of the New Mexico border on the other side of the US-Mexico border in northern Mexico. Uh, as the Gila Cliffs are in what is known as the Mimbres region and the Chaco Canyon and Mesa Verde region. And I want to focus just for a second on Chaco Canyon because that character is going to play a very important role in our story tonight. But part of why it plays such an important and meaningful role is because of its location. It sits, again, maybe even more precisely between the, uh, on the Continental Divide between the Rio Grande uh, and the Colorado River. So that means that places like Canyon de Che, Chaco Canyon, the Pecos there out on the plains and the foothills of New Mexico, the Gila Cliffs and Paquime were all trading with each other across great, great distances. Um, they were trading things like feathers, copper, obsidian, cacao, many of these products across uh, great distances. This is a close up of Chaco Canyon, as I was mentioning earlier. And you can see in that region, and again, we'll take a look at it with other representations later, how it's situated between the San Juan River that uh, flows into the Colorado, and just to the east um, are the tributaries uh, to the Rio Grande. So Chaco Canyon was, and still is, strategically situated at a continental level um, in order to take advantage of trade and trade networks. These are some images of what I was mentioning earlier about the sophistication of development, urban centers uh, in the uh, desert southwest, what we now know as New Mexico. This is a picture of Chaco Canyon, Pueblo Bonito. And this uh, structure also is important to remember that in ancestral indigenous times, the buildings weren't just at the corner of like 4th and Central, or they weren't just, you know, at the corner of Cerrillos and um, Paseo, for example. They were oriented and built in such a way that, that they were uh, in alignment with their environment, both astrologically, astronomically, as well as geographically. So when we think about ancestral trade routes and ancestral connectivity, we're not just thinking about exchange of goods or commodities coming from one part of the continent and going to another. There was a much broader sense of movement, exchange, trade, and valuation that certainly is alien to us now uh, in modern times. This is a picture of the ruins in Paquime um, to the south that I mentioned. This is Mesa Verde to our north. And you also remember what's special about these three in particular is they share an ordinate um, coordination uh, from north to south, Paquime, Gila, Chaco Canyon, and Mesa Verde. And this is uh, Keatshet uh, also to the west near Canyon de Che. 
This is Pecos. I want to mention Pecos for a second because Pecos um, is not far from here. And in many ways, it's the gateway to the plains, uh, one of the gateways to the plains um, in eastern New Mexico and to uh, the Mississippi Valley uh, that was a very important uh, indigenous location for not just trade, but also well into Spanish times. And this um, basically was destroyed. Uh, after uh, the arrival of the Spanish. This is ruins near Abo, New Mexico. I don't know if any of you know where Abo, New Mexico is. It's just to the east of Belen, and that is where the BNSF tracks cross from the plains into New Mexico on their way to Bakersfield and Southern California and the Pacific ports. So even at this time, the um, indigenous populations were really taking advantage of the geography that in subsequent generations and times, Spaniards and uh, Americans would take advantage of. What also was happening at the time was the prevalence of traders and trade networks uh, through these ancestral communities, not just in the New Mexico region down into uh, southern and western Arizona, but deep into Mesoamerica, deep into the Gulf Coast. This is uh, something that as New Mexicans we see uh, stereotypically all the time uh, to demarcate uh, New Mexico, the Cocopelli. But in very serious ways, this figure and this um, uh, merchant um, representation has been found uh, throughout Mesoamerica into uh, southern Mexico. This is another um, uh, uh, illustration of the Cocopelli, and that's in White Rock, New Mexico, not far from here near Los Alamos. This is um, a recording of the um, traders known in Aztec as the Pocheteca, and they were uh, uh, itinerant merchant traders from central Mexico that went all the way up here into uh, New Mexico, southern Arizona, along the Pacific coast to trade these goods uh, that I've been describing. So what I also want to really illustrate here is that our region was continentally connected, continentally engaged, continentally of value much before the arrival of the railroads or the gringos or the Spaniards um, uh, in, in more recent times. This um, are some, uh, these are some images that I really want to show that highlight that kind of importance and impact that trade and exchange networks had in our region uh, before the arrival of the Europeans. And as you can see here in one of the um, uh, examples of pottery from the Mimbres region is the presence of these parrots, these macaws. And we'll see here in a few more slides how important they were to New Mexico, this region, and the indigenous communities that were here. In fact, uh, they were used uh, for ceremonial purposes. I think there was an article in one of the New Mexico uh, newspapers just a few days ago around the discovery or rediscovery of parrot um, sanctuaries and aviaries uh, in New Mexico. So they brought the parrots here and even continued to breed them in places like Chaco Canyon. And according to uh, the story, this was the um, uh, uh, price or the dowry that the uh, suitor had to pay for the hand of the daughter uh, in this uh, community was to get uh, scarlet macaw feathers and bring them back um, to Mimbres. This is uh, here in New Mexico. Actually, it's near Unser Boulevard, surrounded by uh, you know, uh, gas stations and mini malls. Uh, in, in our state. Uh, that can be you know, humorous or tragic as you, uh, you know, choose to see it, but I think it's, again, this kind of interesting relationship about how our history is really still very present uh, here in New Mexico. This is a, a reproduction of a mural near a discovery of an ancestral Pueblo site near Los Lunas, New Mexico, called Pottery Mound, showing, again, the um, relationship and engagement of uh, Pueblo communities here in New Mexico with places um, as far away as Central and, and, and Mesoamerica. One of the other things that maybe you all have known for a long time being in here in New Mexico is the production of turquoise uh, in places not far from here in Cerrillos and Madrid. And the importance of New Mexico as a source of turquoise uh, throughout, again, uh, Meso and Central America. And this is um, a uh, depiction, Aztec depiction of the god of turquoise made from New Mexico turquoise. 
These are um, shells that were found in the Membrace region. And this also, uh, what you can see for anybody who has been to Pakime, I highly encourage it, is the presence of a significant amount of Pacific um, uh, aquaculture uh, remains, the, the trading of shells and other kinds of elements that were uh, harvested from uh, the Pacific Ocean. Another uh, important, um, uh, let's say, economic activity uh, in uh, ancestral Pueblo times was the um, a reliance on the buffalo and how they really um, were an integral part to not only Pueblo economies, but also the plains uh, uh, tribes that would uh, cultivate and harvest bison and trade uh, the products from there. This is a, a map that just generally kind of summarizes what we were just talking about. Uh, the seashells and the things from the Pacific coast would come through Arizona into New Mexico through trading centers like Pakime and through the, the Gila cliffs, but also that um, goods from Meso and Central America would travel great distances north across uh, the Mexican, what's now the Mexican desert uh, to reach New Mexico, trading cultivation of agricultural goods like corn to more nomadic um, uh, tribes out in the plains. Another uh, item that was traded very much was obsidian. This is a picture of, uh, or a map that I created of the Pueblo communities as they were upon the arrival of the Spanish. And as you can see here, many of them are no longer with us. Some of them are. Uh, two that in particular I want to mention are Pecos and Abo, as we mentioned earlier, as being significant uh, areas of trade. What you can also see here in the map is the language group um, that the uh, tribes uh, are associated with. Okay, then the Spanish came, and this really hit the region uh, like a ton of bricks. And what I was saying earlier about these trade routes and these uh, channels of exchange, um, not only allowed uh, ancestral uh, indigenous communities and tribal nations to move and uh, connect with each other across the continent, but also brought uh, the Europeans. Uh, in particular, it's um, uh, the, the, the motivations from a very far away place in Spain, uh, not long after the reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula, really set in motion this transatlantic search for trade routes to the uh, Indies or through um, uh, uh, the oceans. And what they came across was uh, the Americas, and they had to keep searching for a way uh, to um, uh, get to those uh, Pacific uh, places of value. What I want to look at here also is the kind of organizing economic Im influence of the Spaniards and how it was structured. Their system was certainly much different from the Native American and the tribal systems. They had systems of government that were not uh, at all commensurable with tribal and indigenous forms of social structures or political structures or legal structures. They also had a system that was basically uh, based on privileging the uh, home country or, or Spain. So it was an extractive kind of economic model that would take raw materials from the colonies back to Spain in order to be uh, manufactured or where value was added uh, to benefit uh, the, the, um, the metropolis, as I was saying. What happened was a great clash, uh, as we know, between Spanish colonies and uh, Native American communities throughout the Americas, from Canada all the way down to Argentina. And what really happened there was a, a lot of initial um, friction with the Native Americans. And this is one of the first legal uh, documents that we'll look at tonight, which is uh, Las Leyes de las Indias uh, from Spain. And it was a document that sought to um, uh, regulate and also to govern the relationships between the civil ecclesiastical authorities of Spain and the Native American uh, communities uh, uh, over here uh, west um, of Spain. So even then there was a uh, friction around what the Spaniards thought was owed to them, the title to things in this region that the Spaniards thought they had, and also um, what, uh, how that would play out in uh, legal and governance structures. I think we, okay. This is something also I wanted to show you tonight. It's one of the earliest maps of um, New Spain. 
And we're gonna be taking a look at a lot of maps tonight. And maps are important because they show you what the person is thinking or what's valued, what that map is for. But it also can, I think, uh, show us what a certain country, for example, Spain, might want to be saying about the map. So sometimes we look at maps of New Spain and we think that Spain has dominion and control totally and complete uh, over that region. But sometimes that's not always so. And even in European history, the ability to produce a map and put your name on it was part of a propaganda or persuasive uh, effort to show that that territory belonged to you. This is um, something we'll see, uh, as I said uh, repeatedly tonight. This is actually the first um, permission that the King of Spain gave to have New Mexico settled. Uh, this was, or colonized. And this was uh, a document that went to um, a man named Juan de Bautista. It did not go to Añate originally. He was the, the second choice, in fact. But what I want to show about this document is how even a king in Spain can think that there is uh, uh, the ability to assert dominion and control over lands or over people that are so far away. And we'll be seeing, as we continue in this lecture tonight, this kind of friction between sovereignties, the friction between dominion, the friction between control, and what kind of consequences that has had for tribal nations, but also more importantly, what kind of consequences that has had for us generally uh, here in New Mexico. Uh, this is a map that I wanted to show to give you a sense of all the trade routes, the Spanish trade routes that were flowing in and out of New Mexico. And, you know, the, again, the Spaniards came into Mexico from Veracruz to Mexico City and started their march northward, uh, particularly in the late, uh, 16, mid to late 1600s. So one of the first major incursions into what is now New Mexico was the Coronado Expedition, which actually came up uh, from the coast in the Pacific in Sinaloa Loa and Sonora into what is now Arizona and western New Mexico, encountering uh, the Zuñi tribe at that point. And remember, Zuñi is just south of Chaco Canyon. So there has always been this geographical disposition to continental flow and connectivity. But what's also important to note is where Coronado went after that. He went out into the plains. And then after that, people like Oñate and the Dominguez Escalante position, uh, expedition moved west and tried to find uh, trade routes and overland routes uh, to the Pacific. This is a uh, picture from Okeowinge Pueblo from 1896, only because there were no cameras <laughs> around uh, in the uh, uh, late 1500s. I would have liked to have seen uh, it then. But why I'm showing you this is because it was um, a, a Pueblo uh, very near to which Oñate came and made the first permanent settlement uh, in New Mexico. And it has a very important location, as you can see, up near the uh, waters around es what is now Española. And Okeowinge is in this uh, juncture between these two rivers, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the Chama uh, and the Rio Grande. And so coming down from Okeowinge, this was a trade route that the Spaniards built on top of many of those indigenous trade routes that I mentioned earlier, coming to be known as the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro. So I wanna emphasize again the length and the uh, disposition that New Mexico has and has always had to these kinds of trade networks. And these kinds of trade impacts had um, a significant impact on New Mexico, not only because of the sort of colonial structures that the Spaniards uh, imposed when they came here, this uh, presidio system, which was the military garrisons, then they had the ecclesiastical authorities, and then they had uh, what you could call the civilian um, uh, um, agents or the civilian actors. Those civilian actors were basically there to get rich. And what they were um, really subjecting the uh, Native Americans to was a system called the encomendero system, where they not only felt title to the land, but they also possessed title to the Indians' labor. So then, on the other hand, were the ecclesiastical authorities who felt that they had, in some ways, ownership or a right to work with or reduce uh, the Native populations to uh, uh, ecclesiastical communities. So the Indian labor and Native American labor, even in those days, became quite contested uh, between the ecclesiastical and the um, uh, civilian authorities. 
New Mexico was always a very um, delicate outpost of northern Spanish um, uh, colonial expansion. It was always very weak. Even though there may have been a map with uh, Spain printed where New Mexico is now, it doesn't mean that it was very strong. Part of the reason that it was weak was because of its distance from Mexico City and its distance from Veracruz. And what I was saying earlier about the mercantilist system where things were extracted from New Mexico and extracted from the Americas and taken to Spain meant that trade was tightly, tightly controlled by the Spanish crown. So all the ships and all the trade from Spain had to go to Veracruz, uh, Mexico, and then was offloaded to Mexico City and years later made its way up to um, New Mexico along this trade route. And conversely, to get anything out of New Mexico took quite a long period of time. So when you're thinking about um, you know, the precarious nature of a, a colonial settlement here, when you're thinking about getting goods back and forth or even communication lines back and forth to Spain, it became uh, very difficult. When the Spaniards came, they also brought uh, uh, horses. And this really revolutionized uh, tribal communities and indigenous communities, not only in New Mexico, but across uh, North America. The, the pony, the horse, uh, was new to North America. It wasn't here uh, before the Spaniards brought it. And it played a significant role, as we'll see later, particularly in New Mexico, um, when the, the Comanches started to adopt and master uh, horsemanship in the Eastern Plains. Also, the Apache, uh, for some time, were able to really uh, take full use of, of the horses. This allowed Native Americans and uh, tribal nations to have a degree of mobility that they never had before. So even um, that uh, they were um, uh, uh, able and understanding these long distance routes never had the ability to travel so efficiently across them. The other thing that came with the Europeans was the musket, the guns, the firearms. And this, uh, ironically, is still something that is a very big deal in our region, the trafficking of weapons. And this is one of the most common muskets uh, that was used in the uh, late 17th, 18th century and early 19th century. It's of French origin. And it was also important in terms of trade and trade domination to remember that New Mexico and the Eastern Plains and Texas was a proxy war or an outright war between French colonial interests and Spanish colonial interests. So there was a border between New Mexico and what is now Texas that really separated the French um, and the uh, Spanish uh, desires. They had different desires. Uh, Spain wanted things that uh, France didn't and France wanted things that Spain didn't. But what France wanted in particular was just mobility and trade networks and exchange networks. So they really had no interest in this kind of colonizing or um, uh, um, uh, um, proselytizing uh, effort that the Spaniards did, certainly not uh, to the same level. And what happened was the Spaniards would not trade or allow the Native Americans here, the tribal nations, to have access to the firearms. So what was created was something called the gun frontier or the gun border uh, in the Southwest, where Plains Indians were able to uh, trade horses for weapons um, with the French and become armed. And this is one of the main reasons for the ascendancy of the Comanche, uh, which we're gonna look at now. This is uh, the uh, extent in some ways of the Comanche Empire. They uh, came from uh, Colorado, southern, uh, northern Colorado, and moved into the plains here in Northeast um, uh, New Mexico and became, as I said, really masters of the horse. And then they uh, were able to acquire weapons and had essentially an empire in the Americas between New Mexico and Texas uh, for over a century. And part of the, the reason for the strength of their empire was their ability to trade, their ability to be intermediary between the Mississippi Valley uh, and the Southwest. This um, really started to become an issue for uh, Spain and the arrival and the, the growth and the strength of the Comanche. And 
the the trade at that point in the mid 1700s or eight, yeah, mid 1700s really started to focus around Taos. And I want to focus on Taos for a minute because it is in that northeast quadrant of what is now New Mexico. And just on the other side of the mountains from Taos, again, are the eastern plains. So all along New Mexico currently and even then, we have this uh, uh, gateway uh, capacity between uh, the Pacific and the mountains uh, and the eastern plains. Uh, th there was an episode where um, the Comanche were uh, very problematic for the Spaniards, particularly during the time of the governorship of Juan Bautista de Anza. And he was able to uh, exert a lot of pressure and force on the Comanche. And one of the ways that he was able to work with the Comanche was creating trade fairs uh, in Taos. And so Taos then and even now has a very privileged position. Uh, this is an uh, image of a, a Comanche warrior uh, from the, the 19th century. Okay, well then the Americans um, started to continue their inexorable march westward. And the Americans, uh, as you know, acquired the Louisiana Purchase from France and all of a sudden were face to face with the Spanish Empire. So this upstart uh, colony that became a country was now desiring to expand its trade networks expand its trade capacity and push west. And as we'll see over the next century, the next 200 years, this again had a very um, uh, profound impact uh, on tribal nations. So the Americans really wanted to uh, not only get to uh, New Mexico, but really get through New Mexico. And they started to build these things like the Santa Fe Trail. In fact, I think we're not far from the Santa Fe Trail uh, right now. And so, you know, just again, thinking about how past is present. Um, these were um, started to become just pipelines, massive pipelines of migratory flows, of trade flows from uh, the East Coast and the Mississippi Valley, from uh, Independence, Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri, uh, into uh, the Americas. Spain really didn't want to have it at all. Spain really wanted to continue with its mercantilist system and not engage with the Americans in overland trade. Uh, there was a lot of friction there, and then at the same time, you had the uh, growth and expansion of Native American communities uh, in the plains. What was created at a certain point was this uh, trading post. And trading posts started to develop all along the border of New Mexico at that time. This is a trading post that I guess uh, is somehow still standing called Bent's Fort. And Bent's Fort was uh, created in the early uh, uh, 19th century, around uh, 1820, 1830, and started to basically serve as a trade post between what was in Spain, later becoming Mexico, and uh, the American um, colonies uh, to the east. Something that um, Bent's Fort also is known for is the way that they were able to funnel weapons and uh, guns and firearms into uh, Spain and also uh, Mexican territory in New Mexico in exchange for horses. Prior to this, uh, Mexico had revolted and shrugged off uh, Spanish colonial dominance. When it did so, it essentially kicked out or made not welcome the Jesuits, the Franciscans, many of the um, uh, members of the clergy and the cloth who were working with Native American communities, as I mentioned earlier. So you had a kind of loss of authority or loss of control and a lot of more free uh, and independent um, uh, tribal nations moving in the region started to become armed. And the more they became armed, the more unstable the New Mexico colony became, which made it weaker and more easily and susceptible to take over uh, from the Americans. So this, again, is something that we see uh, currently um, in our region. At this point, um, uh, uh, Kearney had come into New Mexico with the uh, the troops and basically took over New Mexico without a shot being fired. There was no real um, revolt at that time um, with Kearney. This is the, um, you see here, the laws of New Mexico from 1846. So at this point, we have a totally different um, structure of legal um, system taking over, which is the common law Anglo-American system. Whereas before we had a, um, a legal system based in medieval Spain, in 19th century Spain, uh, 18th century Spain, but again, completely different from what uh, the Anglo-American uh, system is based on. And we'll see how this is really having tremendous significant impacts in the 20th century to tribal nations uh, in New Mexico. 
the kind of laws, just to um, uh, stay on that for a second, you guys think I might just, you know, um, troll uh, digital archives for pictures of old laws and treaties, um, and it's kind of true. But uh, that, um, those laws brought new uh, conceptions of contract, new conceptions of property law, new conceptions of labor uh, that were, again, different from Spain, but certainly different from uh, tribal nations and ancestrally indigenous systems of social organization, political and economic uh, valuation. Uh, not too long after this um, was concluded uh, the uh, US-Mexico War. And with it came the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And this is a uh, image from here. And you can see I highlighted Article 11. Why did I highlight Article 11? Because this was um, a provision in the treaty between the US and Mexico for joint assistance and collaboration in the eradication of the Apache. Because these Plains Indians, as I was saying earlier, particularly the Comanches, but also the Apache, were creating a lot of trouble for the trade expansion of the US. And then they were even um, creating a lot of problems for Mexico because they would cross the border into Mexico and find escape. So this whole issue of borders and how they allow for um, uh, uh, safety or how they allow for a certain uh, valuation or arbitrage. We didn't just see it in the first slide of tonight's lecture with the cannabis grow in the Navajo Nation. We even see it here in the 19th century with Plains Indians um, being able to cause problems and escape um, punishment by fleeing to another jurisdiction. The Americans at this point, uh, even before the Civil War, were really trying to not just uh, establish and settle their trade routes west, but to bring the railroad west. And again, this is something I want to pause on here for a minute to really highlight the difference in the imperial motivations and framework and mindset of the Spaniards and the gringos or the Americans. The, the Americans were obsessed with mapping the west and engineering the west. Uh, the West to the Americans became a place uh, where you measure it, you value it, you weigh it, you size it, and you learn how to uh, turn it to your advantage. This was much different than um, the Spanish uh, uh, conception of, of the land, and certainly different from uh, ancestral uh, Pueblo and, and tribal uh, conceptions of the land. This is a picture from Embudo Pass. Uh, north of here um, and uh, uh, showing the initial location of, of the tracks uh, in that region. Uh, this is the Treaty of Bosque Redondo, which settled the conflict between the Navajo uh, Nation and the U.S. Army, uh, again, in the, the, the later, latter half of the 19th century. And what we see here um, is the uh, beginning of the Americans' Uh, quest to locate and create reservation systems, uh, not on the US in general, but in New Mexico uh, in particular. And what is also important, and I encourage you all to read this document, it's not very long, but it really shows in some ways uh, the mindset and the impact that American colonialism and American settlement in New Mexico had on uh, uh, tribal nations. This document shows how the Americans and the federal sovereign, the US sovereign, wanted to oversee, regulate, and control many, many aspects of uh, Navajo Nation life, including education, including um, the ability to structure their economic and business practices. All that had to be cleared and approved uh, by the federal government. So this is something that we're gonna be uh, looking at here in a minute in the future, but the um, imposition of sovereignty uh, of the US government on native um, uh, communities and tribal nations in New Mexico is significant uh, to this day. What I want to show you here is the continental impact and the continental movements that those rail um, uh, designs were having, um, particularly on New Mexico. And as I mentioned in the beginning of our lecture, our privileged location here uh, between the Midwest and the upper Midwest and the Pacific ports. And many of these train lines are still in effect today. And one of the second, or not one of, but the second transcontinental railroad was connected in Deming, New Mexico, uh, which at that time uh, was um, uh, recently Apache territory. What you can also see here, which is important to note, is the railroad extending southward from um, El Paso and, and what has become known as uh, Ciudad Juarez. At that time, Mexico had a very 
let's say, um, technocratic president, um, Porfirio Diaz. He was very interested in modernizing the country and wanted that rail connection. And that rail connection um, is still uh, in effect. Now, with this um, arrival and advent of the rail and rail development, you started to get the um, not only the uh, reservation system and the reduction of tribal nations into uh, enclosed areas, but you also started to get the land um, being made available uh, to railroad companies. And this is a map of um, this Atlantic and Pacific Railroad, and you may not be able to see it um, because of the size of the uh, letters, but this is all Northern New Mexico. This is all Northern New Mexico. And all those parcels that you're seeing were land grants uh, given by the federal government to the railroad companies. So on the one hand, um, tribal nations are dispossessed of their land. And on the other hand, the railroad companies are then possessed of uh, land and title and property. And this um, effort here also is responsible for the division of tribal lands in our area known as the checkerboard uh, in the northwest and western part of New Mexico. Because a lot of that land lapsed and went back to the state, but still certain parcels were held um, by the tribal nations. Also, um, not much later and during this time was the sentiment in Washington of um, splitting up and dividing and basically creating um, tribal and reservation systems that matched Anglo-American concepts of title and title to property. And what we see here is the uh, Dawes Act or the General Allotment Act, which had a significant um, uh, negative impact on the integrity and the communality of tribal lands and tribal communities in New Mexico, but certainly uh, all over the United States. And here, what was happening was the uh, uh, continued uh, westward expansion of uh, uh, American and other um, uh, uh, settlers were, um, the point was to try to get them title and get title to land. But this really didn't work uh, for the Native American communities and really reduced their um, uh, title to land by basically about half um, afterwards. The, the, the Americans also were trying, as I said earlier, to really um, isolate and bring tribal nations into communities that would free up trade networks. And also importantly, as I mentioned in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, create peace and security for trade routes. Because if there's no peace or security, uh, there's really a difficult time to be had for commerce. And so commerce and stability uh, really go together. Now, um, what the Americans did, um, I think, uh, really um, had uh, uh, significant, significant um, uh, deleterious impacts on uh, uh, these communities. What we also um, had at this time was the emergence of these trading posts, Navajo trading posts in particular. And so just like in the early 19th century, we had the arrival of trading posts on the edge of the uh, uh, Mexico and Spanish American border. Now we also started to have trading posts arrive on the borders of reservations and state or, or private land here in New Mexico. This is actually a picture of the famous Hubble trading post uh, in uh, Eastern Arizona um, on the uh, border with the Navajo Nation. But you know, as I was saying earlier, the General Allotment Act, the disposition of tribal lands, really kind of um, located tribal nations in areas that were uh, not the best land. Uh, it was very geographically dispersed, hard to get to, inaccessible. And so these uh, trading posts, which were managed and operated by Americans, essentially, or uh, European immigrants, really served as this lifeline upon which uh, the tribal nations depended until they um, uh, acquired uh, the ability to um, uh, be, be less dependent uh, on uh, these kinds of uh, trading posts. But one of the things that um, you know, I think uh, is a challenge for New Mexico, as well as tribal communities, is this question about uh, the geography. 
And as we saw earlier, the geography of New Mexico connects uh, these great distances uh, from the Pacific uh, to the Midwest um, uh, through to the Mississippi Valley. But overland trade is always much, much, much less efficient than uh, trade like um, a maritime trade or riparian trade along uh, river networks. And this is um, maybe one of the only times tonight I'm gonna mention something that I read at St. John's, but I think it's important because it really is also important for us today in public policy in New Mexico just to remember how expensive it is and how expensive it, how expensive it is to build overland networks, whether it's a pipeline or an electronic transmission uh, network or a road or a highway. It's very, very expensive to build overland and then it's also expensive uh, to travel overland. And again, one of the reasons New Mexico is so special is because of the expensive overland trade routes in North America, New Mexico has uh, the most efficient through Albuquerque and then through Southern New Mexico uh, in the Gadsden Purchase. That was from, um, that principle was uh, explained in, in Adam Smith um, in that chapter that I just showed. What was also happening um, into the early 20th century in um, New Mexico and tribal policy in Washington was this idea to provide more sovereignty and more autonomy to tribal nations. So as the Americans came and started to get settled, there was over time this pendulum swinging between policies and laws directed towards more uh, Native American and tribal sovereignty and self-determination or more limited um, self-determination. Uh, so um, this was the uh, Indian Pueblo Land Act. Uh, that um, basically brought the federal recognition of Pueblo lands uh, here in New Mexico. Um, the other thing that happened uh, in the 1920s was that the American government decided to give Native Americans uh, citizenship. And that is um, the um, uh, act that uh, made that possible. But that didn't last forever, and as we'll look at in a second, in the uh, 1950s, there was something called the termination policy, uh, which um, again had significant impacts on tribal land. So tribal land um, had been really reduced, and not just reduced, but something important that I wanted to mention about the Dawes Act is where formal title of tribal land was given to the U.S. government. And that's still true today, mostly. The tribal lands are held in trust by the US government for uh, Native American communities. Now, not to go into too much um, you know, uh, uh, 19th and 18th century um, economic philosophy, but there was before Adam Smith, a school of philosophers who contend that all value is, is real property, all value is land. And that is the source of any kind of um, uh, uh, economic value. People like Adam Smith had, had other ideas about that related to source of value being found in labor and arbitrage and exchange and things like that. But this is something um, that is really important to remember um, as we go forward. So after the Allotment Act, after other kinds of um, decisions by the US government, you started, whenever you divide land, you're gonna create a new jurisdictional oversight. And this is a map from the Bureau of Indian Affairs itself showing the oversight regions for the different levels of supervision of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Imagine that kind of um, exercise of sovereignty or oversight um, over your, your land. And look just in particular here about how concentrated they are uh, in the New Mexico uh, region. This is uh, Title 25 um, of the uh, Code of Federal Regulations, itemizing and listing all the ways that the US federal government as a sovereign exercises uh, oversight and control of, uh, federal, uh, of tribal activity and tribal life. So you can just imagine all those different areas where you maybe have to get uh, some kind of federal approval from the BIA or other kinds of um, uh, federal uh, uh, approval or exception. Something that is um, interesting about you know, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and land is that in order to even lease land or find some way to um, create value out of that land, you need approval by the Bureau of Indian Affairs even to lease. So any of you who are business owners out here or who have leased something, imagine if you had to get Washington's approval uh, before you could lease uh, your property. 
This is a current map of the tribal nations in uh, the continental US and, and, and Alaska there um, at the bottom. And again, look at the concentration of uh, tribal nations um, that uh, are here in New Mexico and how important they are um, to uh, tribal nations in general, but also that geographic location uh, that we've been focusing on uh, through tonight's lecture. Uh, this is a close-up of that same map showing uh, in some ways the most modern spatial mapping of these tribal nations. And again, throughout this lecture, we've seen this evolution in map and, and presentations and how uh, these places have taken place. And something that I said earlier about the Americans and the American mindset, which continues to um, uh, have importance here, is this um, uh, uh, privileging of measurement and privileging of precision. So we really start to see here in this uh, phase of New Mexico's history, how important it is to measure uh, where land begins and where land ends for purposes of the exercise of sovereignty and of oversight. This is a table that I made of um, New Mexico tribal nations as they uh, currently are uh, in, in our state. And you can uh, see here there's um, uh, quite a few uh, uh, tribal nations that are, are uh, really um, uh, part of our community and their um, names, their original names, uh, their BIA designation, uh, their language group, their population, uh, and their, their land area. Now, what's also um, happening in modern times is the uh, growth of trade flows through New Mexico. And the Spanish uh, time here in New Mexico was really uh, focused on uh, mineral extraction, uh, things, uh, uh, materials, metals, things like that. Um, and what is really valuable um, for uh, America and for current New Mexico is not just uh, these trade works, but also uh, energy deposits, uh, which we'll look at in a minute. And this is the BNSF line going through um, uh, Western Acoma lands um, to, to Gallup. This is a map showing the flows of um, uh, uh, different kinds of modal uh, trade through New Mexico. And you can see here that of along the Rockies, this corridor is uh, the most significant, uh, also combined with this uh, interstate corridor. Uh, I-25 is not as busy or as pressured as um, I-10 is or I-40. I just drove uh, part of I-40 again over the holidays and it's like uh, 18 wheeler uh, dream. I mean, it's just one 18 wheeler after the other. And that, of course, goes through um, New Mexico. The other thing that we'll be looking at in a second here is uh, this relationship between Southern New Mexico and Northern Mexico and that nexus. And to some degree, um, what remains of that Camino Real de Tierra Adentro that I mentioned um, earlier. So what I wanna take a, a minute here to look at very quickly is uh, some economic data in and around tribal nations. Now, as I told you earlier, Americans love to measure things, they love data, and they love to manipulate data. Uh, what we have here is not only data on domestic flows and commodity flows in and out of New Mexico, but also some uh, international flows. What's important to remember, though, at the same time is data for tribal nations is very scarce. It's very scarce. What there is of it, I've been able to graph and present here um, in tonight's lecture, which we'll take a look at in a second. Even population and land area data, which I showed earlier, uh, is not so easily found. And what, you can, what we're looking at here is, this is uh, Bureau of Transportation statistic data, looking at New Mexico as a source of um, inbound domestic freight. And we get a lot of mixed freight and some natural gas and petroleum products. Pay attention to electronics here, as we'll see, you know, why is New Mexico a destination for domestic uh, electronics cargo? And what relationship that will have to current trade relations and current impacts. Um, this is as an origin of domestic freight. So what does New Mexico send out um, uh, uh, and, and in what volumes? Uh, crude petroleum, natural gas, minerals, and, and some fuel oils. Those are three of the uh, top five there. And we'll see here in a minute what is 
really kind of serendipitous and amazing about the value of the northwestern part of New Mexico and New Mexico in general is not just these trade routes, but for modernity, it's the source of energy. Okay, not just things like coal and natural gas and uranium, but also now um, things like uh, solar energy. But make no mistake, New Mexico in some ways still is a resource extractive economy like it was uh, even during Spanish times. And so that's something very difficultly we've been trying to get over in New Mexico is how to diversify the economy, how to create value added opportunities. Now, what does this mean for tribal nations? If you're a tribal nation and you're thinking about all that um, oversight and uh, uh, complicated um, uh, uh, economic system, what are your alternatives? Well, you have resource extraction or you have things like arbitrage opportunities with gaming or with um, other kinds of initiatives uh, that we'll see. But oil and gas is a huge, huge um, driver of the New Mexico economy for sure. This is El Paso um, uh, as a destination of domestic freight. So El Paso receives a lot of refined petroleum as gasoline. This is the southern New Mexico region. Um, as well as electronics. And again, why is electronics popping up? Why is New Mexico and El Paso as a destination um, so influenced by, um, by electronics? This is the New Mexico zone or the El Paso, New Mexico zone, what it sends out. And it sends out electronics. Okay, uh, there'll be a punchline, I swear. Okay, <laughs> but just remember here as we go through this, what um, role electronics as a domestic export from New Mexico and how that relates to the New Mexico and El Paso zone as a uh, destination of domestic uh, electronics trade. Okay, this is something I wanted to show um, also as well. These are um, annual uh, uh, ranking of airports uh, by freight, cargo freight. This is Federal Aviation Administration data. And what's interesting is the relative um, position of El Paso and Albuquerque receiving around the same amount of uh, freight per year. But look at Gallup. Gallup is not just a center of trade uh, for the railroads and for the interstate, but also for air cargo. And the only other uh, airport that ranks in terms of cargo in the New Mexico region, interestingly, is Tucumcari, which is also on that um, trade route. So Gallup, I think we might not think of it so much or we might underestimate, but it is a significant um, uh, trade uh, network and corridor uh, for um, both domestic and international trade. So speaking of international trade, I wanna show you this map. I told you there's a lot of maps, but this is a visualization of our region according to uh, the Customs and Border Protection. And for some reason, New Mexico is known as the El Paso sector. So this whole state and our entire state gets its name uh, from this uh, trade corridor here on our southern border. And now we're gonna take a look at what's coming through New Mexico um, and what's going into Mexico uh, through that um, uh, 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 trade um, access point. Uh, in a few moments. The first thing I want to do is I want to talk about the last 20 to 30 years of international trade policy, how it's been affecting New Mexico, where it comes from, and what some of its principles are. So this is the general agreement on, on tariffs and trade. I won't belabor this, but the, the point here is that um, in, the, in the, the 70s, 80s, and particularly the 1990s, th there was this um, uh, flourishing of trade agreements across uh, uh, the uh, globe, uh, across many, many countries. And what they were building on was one of these principles that grew out of the Second World War uh, in order to make sure that countries didn't um, close their boundaries or their borders uh, to, to each other's goods. So this was agreements uh, between countries to lower those, um, what you could call financial barriers. For me to import something from New Mexico now became cheaper if w we were both members of the general uh, agreement on tariffs uh, and trade. So um, this grew into the 80s and 90s until you got to something that was very desired by the Mexican government called the North America Free Trade Agreement. And the North America Free Trade Agreement, again, would have a really important impact on New Mexico uh, and the tribal nations. One of the people who um, you know, basically really saved NAFTA or cursed us with NAFTA, depending on your um, uh, outlook, uh, was um, uh, Bill Richardson. And he um, was able to convince um, uh, his colleagues in the House to vote for NAFTA in spite of their concerns over labor and what it would do 
um, to the labor movement in the United States. Now, what was special about NAFTA was a couple things. First of all, it was called the North America Free Trade Agreement. So we'll see how that uh, is distinguished um, now in, in current times but uh, in, in just even its title. So it has even an aspirational title of this kind of integration of North America. But what it also relied on was not just to make sure that uh, the US and Mexico uh, lowered the tariff barriers so things were now moving back and forth across the border much more seamlessly and much less costly, much more efficiently from a financial point of view. But the other thing that NAFTA did for the first time in history was include an investment provision so that as a US investor in Mexico, I could make sure according to this treaty that my investment was not gonna get um, expropriated or nationalized by that government uh, without compensation or, or just cause. So you had this two feet in the late 90s of how um, uh, trade was working in North America. I could invest in northern Mexico, in a maquila, for example, and then easily have those products imported back into the United States um, and sent across the country. And think then again to this privileged position that New Mexico has in terms of its east-west connectivity and also its north-south connectivity. So NAFTA had a, a very, very important impact um, on New Mexico. Then China joined the WTO uh, in 2001, and WTO was the successor uh, to, to the GATT. And as we'll see here in the trade data in a second, the real impact that China had on uh, New Mexico and the New Mexico uh, Customs District. This is just, uh, I told you, I just you know searched digital archives uh, for, uh, for PDFs. But I, I think it's important because it's kind of the original source showing you know, these kinds of how law and ideas uh, really take effect, uh, how something, an agreement just becomes paper and then that paper has uh, physical force uh, uh, in the world. All right, so El Paso Customs District, this is what El Paso exports and showing uh, to who we export. Basically, everything that comes through New Mexico on its way uh, to another um, part of the world through the El Paso Customs District goes uh, to Mexico. So New Mexico is highly, highly dependent and also strategically important uh, to US-Mexico trade. The other thing I wanna mention here is this growth since 2001 of foreign exports through the El Paso Customs District. What am I talking about? Okay, so the El Paso Customs District exports moving out of the El Paso Customs District, mostly going to Mexico. A foreign export is a good that comes inbound into the United States, is not altered, and then is immediately exported to a third country. So through New Mexico and through the El Paso Customs District, the growth of foreign exports coming through New Mexico, going directly to Mexico is increasing. Uh, these, you might have an inkling what kind of commodities they are or where they come from. But you can see here, as these exports broken down by commodity type, they're essentially electronics or um, uh, uh, pieces or inputs that go into computers or office machines. Where are those made in the world? And when did that kind of production start to really uh, uh, take off? It started to take off it, when China joined the WTO and became really the world's only uh, manufacturer of electronics, something we're still dealing with right now, in many ways giving rise to the opening of the semiconductor uh, facility in um, Arizona that was announced earlier this week. So I just wanna mention again, what kind of commodities are flowing through New Mexico? And let's keep this in mind when we start thinking about the nature and composition of the New Mexico economy and if it's at all related to those kinds of commodities. Things that are uh, foreign sourced, so going back to the growth in foreign exports coming through New Mexico, these are everything that's foreign sourced, electron and integrated circuits, typewriters, office machines, insulated wire, video monitors, phone sets, automatic data processing machines. We're gonna take a look in a second at why all that is coming uh, through the El Paso Customs District. A lot of it's going to Juarez, but um, a little bit of it is, is going just to the west of Juarez. So these are um, percentage of foreign exports showing El Paso Customs District versus other US Customs District. In 2020, we reached a peak of 54% of all exports by value out of El Paso were a foreign source. 54% of everything by value that was going out of El Paso into Mexico was of a foreign source. 
And this is primarily uh, Chinese uh, uh, inputs. And we lead any other uh, customs district uh, in the entire US. So in terms of imports, again, we basically import everything from Mexico, but also um, uh, the New El Paso Customs District is in growing increasingly uh, from China. And these are the top two countries. I didn't just pick China and Mexico. These are the top two. So you can, this essentially is the gap um, that this uh, export value um, shows um, or import value from China. And the things that we are uh, importing here um, are automatic data machines, medical and surgical equipment, insulated wire, things that deal with the electronic sector, but also to some degree with the um, uh, automotive sector. Okay, let's talk about economic conditions real quick. Again, I wanted to show in some ways the question, how do I know what a tribal community's economy looks like? We really don't. There's no data in census. There's no data in the Bureau of Economic um, uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis to, to uh, delineate and to demarcate this. So first I wanted to show the relationship of New Mexico economically and the size of its economy to our neighboring states in the Four Corners region. But the other thing I wanted to show is what we had with respect to tribal nations data. And this uh, comes from the uh, census. And the census only has two observations. There should be another observation from 2020, but nevertheless, we're only getting an observation on the employment and type of employment and composition of employment on tribal nations every five years. And again, this is all aggregated. So I took every tribal nation's um, data and put it together to make a New Mexico composite. Uh, so you can, it's very difficult even sometimes to distinguish uh, what smaller reservations and smaller uh, tribal lands um, have. But what you can see here is that the kind of employment um, industries, uh, industries that dominate employment are healthcare, social assistance, education, accommodation of food service, retail trade, public administration, construction, and manufacturing. Uh, these are not necessarily the same kind of industries that support uh, or produce a lot of the commodities uh, that came across uh, in those trade flows. What I did here was something um, where I renamed the county data in which the tribal lands are found to get a sense of what kind of economy the tribal um, communities are surrounded by. So this, uh, for the Tewa Hikaria um, uh, counties, this is uh, Santa Fe and Rio Riba counties, this shows the composition of our economy in our region. We have a, um, a heavy presence of government industry, real estate as well, um, as well as professional and business services, healthcare, um, and social assistance. To some extent, mining, uh, oil and gas extraction, but less so here in Santa Fe and, and Rio Arriba. What we have here in Sandoval and Cibola counties, where the Keres and Jemez Pueblos are located, uh, is we have, again, real estate, government, professional business services. So we'll see these kinds of industry sectors continue to reappear in the New Mexico economy. Why we had here manufacturing was the presence of the uh, Intel manufacturing facility uh, that was brought uh, during the Richardson administration, which is starting to come online again because of the trade tensions between um, uh, not just the US and China, but the West and China and its hold and monopoly over electronic um, uh, manufacturing. But again, what I'm trying to do here is present as much data and as much characterization as we can of uh, 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 tribal or tribally proximate economic conditions in order to understand uh, what's going on in our state and the role that trade uh, is playing there. So with respect to Diné and Zunyi communities uh, out west, huge amount of reliance on government, but also mining and oil and gas extraction, um, which uh, we will definitely take a look at here um, uh, in a second. And the northern Tiwa Pueblos and Taos, again, real estate, government, healthcare, social assistance, just these common typical industry sectors uh, in New Mexico. Also here, this is uh, for uh, Albuquerque, so this is Bernalillo County, so not necessarily maybe the best way to understand, but certainly important to think about what kind of counties uh, economies are um, that uh, surround um, our Pueblo and uh, tribal nations. Okay, and this is Mescalero, Apache County. Again, government, healthcare, real estate, 
um, professional and business services. Huge, huge presence of um, government. So I want to talk in particular now sort of as we um, uh, kind of uh, go through some uh, particular uh, elements of tribal uh, economies and lands uh, is energy production. And as I was saying earlier, uh, the Four Corners has some of the most important and most valuable uh, energy resources in the whole United States and in some ways the whole world, particularly so with respect to natural gas. Uh, this is the Four Corners area. There's Chaco uh, Canyon, uh, as I mentioned earlier. There's the Jicaria Apache uh, Nation and the Navajo Nation. And what is happening here is a tremendous amount of um, uh, natural gas and to some degree uh, petroleum extraction. And this actually just came out a few days ago. This was a Chaco Canyon study by the um, Bureau of Land Management. And you can see here why so many colors. This is the Chaco Canyon um, National Monument. And this area here is the study area where a lot of oil and gas deposits are. And every color, every different color is a different jurisdiction. So again, we're seeing this trend in New Mexico about how uh, 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 sovereigns and the arrival of different sovereigns over time has broken up uh, land and the jurisdictional control and authority over land and the sovereignty uh, over the land. So this is um, a mixture of BLM land, uh, uh, land that's held uh, in fee by uh, Native Americans or Navajo, for example, as well as state land uh, and other stakeholders. But what's going on here, as you can imagine, is the tremendous um, interest in Chaco Canyon and this region for natural gas. The San Juan Basin is the most productive onshore natural gas field uh, really in the world. Okay, and what's also happening um, with that Four Corners area is the ability to um, extract and exploit that region because of horizontal drilling, otherwise known as fracking. So there's a tremendous amount of energy extraction going on here. This is the Supreme Court decision, U.S. versus Shoshone, that granted uh, or at least acknowledged and um, uh, 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 found that the um, tribal nations had a right to their own energy development and energy production and didn't necessarily have to rely on uh, the, the U.S. government. This is just to also show you about New Mexico natural gas production and how it's grown over um, the recent years and how it's going to continue to grow. And part of the reason why it's going to continue to grow is because natural gas, like other hydrocarbons, is an internationally traded uh, commodity. So it's important not only to places like Mexico, but it's more and more important internationally because of things like the Russia-Ukraine conflict and other um, uh, uh, choke points in the natural gas system. This is a map from the uh, Department of Energy showing coal infrastructure. And here is where um, uh, the Four Corners uh, are. This is the natural gas infrastructure and resources. And here's Santa Fe and Albuquerque, and there's the Four Corners. And you can see again, uh, just like in the very beginning of our presentation, the importance of New Mexico as a transit point for uh, really important global commodities um, around the world and how they get there through the Pacific ports down into East Texas and onto Houston and through uh, to the Gulf. But what I want to just focus on here again is the importance of these tribal lands and tribal communities to these kinds of commodities and trade flows uh, that arise uh, in the world and take place uh, and effect here in New Mexico. This is uh, national, natural, gas, natural uh, gas and oil assessments uh, here in the uh, region. And you can see here oil wells are delineated by green and gas is red. So San Juan Basin does produce coal. It does produce coal methane. It does produce petroleum. But what it really excels in is the production of natural gas. These are locations of uranium mines uh, in New Mexico. And you can see here along this uh, I-40 corridor in Grants in particular, and to some degree up in the Navajo Nation, uh, you have significant mining activity uh, for uh, uranium. The other thing that's happening um, in uh, these tribal lands, as we looked at in the beginning, was that uh, as the jurisdictions have grown, have waxed and waned over time, in tribal uh, communities and tribal nations. The jurisdiction of who's in charge um, over crimes is 
very, very, very complicated. It's a highly specialized area of law and it's still uncertain, even if you're specialized in it, to determine who's responsible for the crime and then who's responsible for enforcing the crime. These things depend on things like blood quantum. Is this person a Native American? Is this person a member of the Native American tribe? as status of the perpetrator, who the victim is. Is the victim Native American? Is the victim not Native American? Did it happen in tribal land? Did it happen outside tribal land? All these things became, become quite, quite difficult. And imagine if we had those same kind of difficulties uh, when we were trying to prosecute in the first or, or in the third here in New Mexico. It would make criminal um, justice very, very difficult. And so tribal nations have long struggled with uh, the ability to bring uh, um, uh, perpetrators to justice uh, in tribal communities. And why that becomes more and more difficult is again because of New Mexico's location along these trade networks. And trade networks are not just used for legitimate goods, for um, typewriters and uh, seats for cars and electronic uh, components. They're also, it's also a trade network for things like weapons, people, uh, narcotics, and uh, money laundering, uh, et cetera. So New Mexico, in some ways, is also prone to organize crime impacts, but particularly so on tribal nations because of that sometimes weak ability to enforce uh, crimes. This is a map of the um, uh, high intensity drug trafficking area in New Mexico. And you can see here that it overlaps um, uh, places where many of these tribal nations are located. So just to emphasize the point that New Mexico is not just proximate to, um, uh, connected to organized crime activity from uh, Mexico, China, as we saw in that very first uh, slide, but that it also um, uh, goes through these areas that we've been uh, discussing. This is um, some uh, financial um, uh, crime data, suspicious activity reports. Not all suspicious activity reports result in a crime. They're just suspicious. But what we can see here is the growth of suspicious activity reports, uh, particularly in Doniana County on the U.S.-Mexico border, and has actually overtaken uh, Bernalillo County. I chose these other counties um, because they are counties where those tribal nations are located. And to some degree, um, they're still quite low. But at the same time, remember, there's not necessarily the same presence of banking or banking services in tribal communities as there are uh, in places like Doniana County and Bernalillo County. Violent crime in New Mexico. This is uh, New Mexico uh, rate per 100,000, and this is uh, the national average. So New Mexico has been really seeing a, a tremendous impact and growth in violent crime over the years. Uh, as trade flows have uh, continued to increase and continue to grow. This is tribal crime data. Again, I aggregated it from Department of Justice data. Uh, and you can see here that uh, crime and violent crime in tribal nations is also on the rise. So all these things are related, all these things are connected and asking us really what we want to do um, uh, with our future. This is a uh, picture of the Public Law 280 Act, which provided certain states, um, uh, uh, certain states jurisdiction for crimes uh, in Indian lands. New Mexico was not one of these uh, states, but this was part of what I called the termination era, where Congress started to take away and really just allow states to enforce more jurisdiction uh, in tribal territory. Recently, uh, two Supreme Court cases related to crime have come about in, um, uh, uh, the, from the Supreme Court. One here is the McGirt versus Oklahoma decision, which was authored by Gorsuch, restoring and reestablishing treaty claims in Oklahoma uh, based on a criminal law issue. But then a year later, um, Kavanaugh authored the Oklahoma versus Castro Huerta decision. Um, and this uh, um, decision basically allowed Oklahoma to authorize or to extend its criminal jurisdiction into um, tribal lands, which it hadn't uh, had um, uh, previously. What I wanted also to focus on um, here as we uh, uh, end this section is this issue of uh, reservations as places of uh, economic arbitrage. So this is a Tesla facility uh, in Nambe Pueblo here, just to the north, and it was allowed to open or able to open in Nambe because it's not, because the tribal laws allowed it. New Mexico state law does not allow for Tesla dealerships or Tesla businesses in the state because of our car dealership law. 
So you can see how along that um, corridor uh, going north of here, things like uh, the Tesla, um, um, the Tesla uh, um, uh, um, retail space or even gambling, that they're allowed to, or they're taking advantage of things that are otherwise not permissible in New Mexico but making them permissible um, on tribal lands. That can be in some ways healthy for an economy if you've got different economies competing and offering freedoms or market activities that one wouldn't. But sometimes that kind of arbitrage um, can create problems and a race to the bottom. For example, like with looking at a macro sense with the North America Free Trade Agreement or even China's entry into the WTO, nobody can compete with Chinese wages and nobody can compete with Chinese regulatory costs. So that resulted in a huge shift, for example, of labor and um, uh, production uh, to places like China, but also Mexico. And Mexico is just to the south of us. So if we're thinking about manufacturing jobs or investment in any kind of industry, we're always gonna have to compete with Chihuahua and those wages there. With respect to organized crime, this is arbitrage is also active in criminal activities. Because if I know I can get away with something in a territory or a jurisdiction or, or a, a land or a tribal uh, community, I'm going to probably try to take advantage of it. And tribal nations have suffered for many years because of the opacity and the difficulty of uh, enforcing justice uh, for crimes that, that happen uh, in Indian lands. Also, energy production. As we saw earlier, this is having a huge impact, um, not just on um, the uh, environment in the region, but also on the uh, sacred origins and the uh, communities uh, in that Northwest um, area. Okay, so uh, we're gonna look here um, uh, at the end of this uh, lecture uh, with a view to the future, to see what's being done, what has been done, and, and what might we all be able to do uh, together. Uh, this map I wanted to show because it was published um, before, after the U.S.-Mexico War, but before the Gadsden Purchase. And the Gadsden Purchase, as we all know, takes its name from uh, an ambassador to Mexico, but was uh, given to uh, southern New Mexico. So after the U.S.-Mexico War, the U.S. wanted this territory down to the red line, and Mexico wanted this territory up to the blue line. And just here is Mesilla. So Mesilla, I don't know if you guys have been to Mesilla, but you can see it says 1854. Uh, and that's when it basically um, became part of the United States. And Las Cruces was created just to the north of that. Why did the gringos and the Americans want this stretch of land? Because that was even more efficient than that BNSF line through Abo and northern New Mexico that we looked at earlier. This is the 32nd parallel where the Southern Pacific Railroad and I-10 currently pass and El Paso is located. So the United States was able to purchase that uh, from Mexico after the war. But my point here is that trade, trade and the desire for trade and the value of trade have real world implications on who owns the land and who desires the land. So even at this point in the US-Mexico relationship, the US was always pushing to get a handle on these valuable trade routes. These valuable trade routes are still with us and our tribal nations still live on these um, uh, trade routes and really, I think, require our attention. Some of the things that are happening around the world that we should be aware of is the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, which was a new iteration of a free trade agreement between the three countries. As I mentioned earlier, there's nothing romantic about that title. There's nothing aspirational. It's just like four nouns together uh, followed by the word agreement. So um, you can see that this, uh, the generation of this kind of trade agreement also responds to a lot of these macroeconomic global tensions between the East and the West, between the US and China. And this really scales back a lot of the provisions that were available in NAFTA. And what this also does is raise regional content value. So now Chinese goods are gonna have a much more difficult time entering the US and Mexico and North American industrial uh, platform on a tariff-free basis. So only goods that have like, for example, 75% North American content are allowed to pass across the border uh, without tariffs. This is the China phase one tariff deal, which also um, uh, came about about two years ago, two and a half years ago during the Trump administration to really reestablish and reset uh, US-China uh, relations, particularly in response to labor and labor um, uh, 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 
complaints about uh, Chinese um, uh, imports. Many of you may know who this gentleman is. Uh, his name is John Pinto. He was a senator here in New Mexico, a very uh, important person, um, a true leader. He was Navajo. And something that um, uh, this senator did, I think that, that really uh, is with us and should uh, serve in some ways as an inspiration is he did many, many things. He was a code talker, a veteran, a senator, but he also authored something called the State Tribal uh, Collaboration Act. So in many ways, this um, whole presentation has been a journey down the road of division and the road of parceling and the road of reduction and the road of um, uncertainty. But people like uh, Senator Pinto wanted to stop that and really, I think, reverse the tide of the divisions that can exist in our state because of the ju different jurisdictions. And um, this is from uh, 2008, and it took effect basically immediately, interestingly enough. This uh, didn't wait till the end of the legislative session. This had an emergency clause and took effect immediately. And what's really important about it is it's an aspirational document, and it also has some uh, requirements of state agencies and state actors. But I think at ground and at basis, it's an aspirational document to really bring together the states and the tribes in a way that they never had been before. And it's something I think that uh, uh, we're still building on, and it's a legacy uh, that offers a lot of promise and a lot of future. Some of the other things that were created around this time were the Indian Affairs Department, elevating it from an office of Indian Affairs within the governor's office to a full uh, agency, which has a, a really important role and impact in our tribal communities around New Mexico, particularly with things like infrastructure and other kinds of funding. As I mentioned, the other area where it's really active is a Tribal Infrastructure Fund. So this is to show you that in spite of the, the scars of history, in spite of the pressures of uh, macroeconomic influences, global trade, global commodities, that we here in New Mexico as communities still have the ability to work together and build bridges legislatively and at the state tribal level between sovereigns to create a visibility and an understanding between the communities uh, to better um, serve each other. This is something I think that is also worth noting called the Joint Powers Agreement. Doesn't necessarily get a lot of attention um, uh, in the media, uh, but it is a um, mechanism in New Mexico law allowing different jurisdictions, even different sovereigns to join into a common pact. So you see here that um, a public agency for this law means the federal government or, as you see here, an Indian nation, tribe or Pueblo or subdivision of an Indian nation. So this is an opportunity in New Mexico law, a mechanism and a framework to really build uh, structures and frameworks uh, to move together on a joint powers basis, an exercise of joint powers. I think that's uh, pretty uh, remarkable. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention here was a couple of these uh, areas with cooperation in criminal law. Things like uh, mutual aid, allowing state and tribal uh, law enforcement uh, to work uh, and support each other across jurisdictions. Missing persons information clearinghouse. This is another initiative at the state level and also recently at the federal level to build shared databases and shared information between the different communities to understand what's going on um, with uh, um, missing people. And this is actually from at the federal level, which I just mentioned from the 116th Congress, which was not too long ago, um, bridging the agency data gaps and ensuring safety for uh, Native Communities Act. So, so my point here is, is that trade creates divisions. And a lot of times these divisions, if left unchecked or if left unattended to or if not explained, can create darkness, can create uh, frictions uh, between neighbors. I won't understand my neighbor, my neighbor won't understand me. But I think that uh, even at the state level and even at the community level, we have the power to build uh, bridges together um, that we didn't have before. This is a map, yes. <laughs> I wanted to put one map in here, okay. Uh, and this map is uh, made in Europe and uh, shows uh, North America at a certain point um, uh, in the, the mid 1700s as it's being colonized. 
And there's this uh, demarcation here as parts unknown. We, we just haven't gotten there yet. And again, remember like how sometimes difficult New Mexico is to access, particularly from uh, maritime areas, but how important New Mexico is uh, to maritime and international trade. This um, is a uh, satellite image at night of North America. And what you can really see here is the continued growth and expansion towards the West and towards the Pacific. So that centuries old motivation and desire to move from Europe across the Atlantic through the Americas to the Pacific still continues. We saw it with um, the US-China trade. We saw it with the influx of electronics coming into New Mexico, being sent down into Mexico and back into the US market. New Mexico is really part and parcel of global trade and really provides those kinds of supports. Uh, this is not gonna change. It's not gonna go anywhere soon. This is not static. We should definitely be thinking towards the future about what kind of pressures are gonna be coming and how to take care of each other uh, through um, these kinds of cross-border and cross-jurisdictional frameworks that I mentioned. So what's a map? And who makes maps? And why do we make maps? And what's a map for? And I wonder what maps you see in the slide in front of you now and what kind of maps uh, we need uh, maps for uh, um, the uh, joint efforts on uh, criminal justice or economic development or education or economic development. None of the maps that I showed you tonight were from New Mexico. None of the maps I showed you tonight were from New Mexico, except for maybe the laws uh, that we saw that in many ways were um, inspired by the work of John Pinto. So it really begs the question, what is a map? How am I gonna use maps in my life? How am I gonna use maps in New Mexico? How we can use maps uh, better to understand each other uh, and better to work together. And I think that without a doubt, uh, those maps will take inspiration from our past, uh, from Chaco Canyon, uh, from the uh, trade routes and, and the connectivity that we've always had here uh, in New Mexico um, as we chart our way uh, uh, into a prosperous uh, but uncertain future. Thank you so much.